Now, if that is the case, then be consistent. Then you cannot sit on the fence and suddenly claim here, here I don't know. Uh, basically, uh, you say I don't know because, again, you're afraid of the consequences if you commit yourself to one position or another. That's simply copping out, and that's, frankly, being more dishonest than the atheist. So I have less respect for the agnostic how than I have for the atheist. How about an the atheist that I can that understand. That cannot, the agnostic I don't understand at all. That you cannot know. How about an agnostic that says you cannot know? He, he, he says you can't know. Not that he doesn't know, but you cannot. And, and, and he can prove it in different ways that he says he can prove it. There's different kinds. I mean, there's that's agnostic exa- theists, that's, that's exactly, agnostic atheists. That's, that's exactly what I just said. If he says you cannot know, this means you cannot know anything. And yet he acts and behaves as if he does know something. He acts precisely because... He's talking about in, in absolute terms. I'm talking... In, in probable in terms that doesn't... Forget, really forget absolute terms. Him. Make the same judgments. Like I told you last time I was here. Do not treat religion as less than anything else you treat in life. Religion is not going to make him hungry or you let hungry. Me, let me, let me finish. Will you let me finish? Do not treat religion as anything less than in life that you wouldn't let yourself be tricked or cheated out of a lousy uh, quarter can of pop. You don't want to be taken for a fool. So then likewise, do not simply accept this credulity, whatever some Tom, Dick and Harry tells you. That's one thing. That's placing religion at the bottom of the scale. By the other hand, do not treat religion any different, higher than science. If certain scientific statements are good enough for you, if certain philosophical, practical statements are good enough for you, then treat religion the same way. If the argument for the reality, the existence of the truth of X is good enough when it comes to other matters, then that same argument should be good enough when it comes to religion. I cannot have absolute knowledge of this, the same as you do not have absolute knowledge for there. Yet there you are prepared to act upon that which your premises and that which your conclusions and that which your assumed knowledge, which to the extent of your ability, has provided for you is enough for you to accept it as a fact of reality then that should be also enough to accept for you as a fact of reality when it comes to religion right. if not you're playing a double standard game but, but over there I must act it's not that I just do act it's that I must act and over here also you're, not everybody is, is so concerned some, I, I, pe- some people think that it's only a one in an infinite chance that there's even an afterlife so why should I spend my whole life which is short it's limited must you take an airplane ever? no you don't must exactly so don't say must act so therefore you have a choice not to take an airplane and yet these people will take an airplane even though they the e- even though that they have no proof whatsoever <laughs> that that airplane is so safe that it will definitely not crash and nothing is going it's to happen it's based on probability that exactly measured, exactly and because of probability, it is sufficient for you to stake your life on it. Even though you are not required that you must use the airplane. Now, if that's good enough, that probability for this, then the same level of probability has to be good enough when it comes to God and religion as well. That's right, but there's nothing, there's, no such, there's nothing to base the probability of God on. There's, there's okay, no, there's we, are going, no, we are going around in circles. I know we're going around in circles, but that's what I'm saying. It's there the same no probability, the same probability. You have certain you arguments, God existing you have to say, you have certain chance, arguments that you see chance. that certain, certain facts, certain experiences, <laughs> excuse me, you have certain experiences which are good enough for you, which is what scientific method is all about, certain experiences, certain experiments, which are not foolproof, and they are good enough for me to say, till here, that's enough. Then the same type of experiments of seeing these effects, of seeing certain experiences, should be good enough when it comes to explanation okay, to that. Okay, I, I, that this may be seemingly more practical and this is more theoretical becomes irrelevant. What we are talking is honesty. What we are talking about is criteria. What we are talking about is standards. Whether these standards may have practical implications or not, is irrelevant. Okay, if it's good enough for the goose, it has to be good enough for the gander. Okay. One, one more question. So if, 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 if you're saying, you're saying it, it can't be that six million people would accept the truth of a Bible that one, that one or two people wrote. So how come in the Begahavid Gita there are stories of, of wars that had all these weird creatures and stuff that millions of people, it says over there, were at the war. And I mean, back in the day, don't you think there were millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people that read that book and 
Don't you think they wouldn't accept it because they knew it wasn't true, just like the Jews wouldn't accept the Bible at that time 3,000 years ago? The Bible wasn't true. Two answers to you. Who takes the Bhagavad Gita as an historical document? The Hindus? No. Do they? No. They don't. Neither the Bhagavad Gita, nor the Vedas, nor the Rig Vedas, nor the Upanishads. None of them. Okay? That's number one. They see it number two. Work. Number two. Even if they would take it as an historical document. Which they don't. There's not a single Hindu that takes it as a historical document. Even if they would. You would still have the book say so. Just because the book says so means nothing. So the Bible is just a book that says the so. The Bi Bible being a book that just says so is also meaningless and worthless. Okay. If it would be just the Bible as a book. We have not only the Bible as a book, we also have the tradition that accompanies this Bible. An unbroken chain of tradition. That, we, that, that, that only says, that, that the unbroken chain is only something that says in recent books that can be traced back a few hundred or thousand nonsense. years. Not, nonsense. Total nonsense. They found non-canonized versions of non Nonsense. Total nonsense. It can't be that... that, that listen now, you ask a question, let me answer you. The Bible is a book which was written, let's assume, following the book itself, by Moses. Okay? By Moses at his time, and handed over to the people by Moses. One copy of the Torah to each one of the tribes. And what does this Torah say to these people that passed down this Torah throughout these generations? That these and these things happened to you. Here you came, not talking about the book of Precious now, talking from the Sefer Shemaisan. That here you were in Egypt, you were enslaved. <coughs> then you came out from there. Then you experienced this. And then you experienced that. And then this happened. And then that happened. The whole 40 years of history of the wanderings of the desert. And that book is handed down to these people who allegedly these events happened to. Who allegedly had those experiences. And these people are the ones who passed down this book now. Now if I get a book like that which talks about me and tells me my life history and I know my life history and I know, hey, this never happened, this, this, I, I never said this, I never saw this, I never heard this. What is the story of the Torah? We don't rely on the text of the Torah. We rely on the tradition that forms, we can go two ways in that. We can go from the top down, from the generation of Moshe, or we can go from the bottom up, from our generation. From our generation you can go that today there are so and so many people who received from their parents and the previous generation that they received that from their parents. And I don't think even the, the most uh, atheistic Jew or the most reformed Jew would deny that 300, 400 years ago it wasn't just that orthodoxy is like today 10-20% of the population that orthodoxy was then 90% of the population. That 90% of the Jews, three, two, three hundred years ago, firmly believed, yes, what we, this tradition that we have is an unbroken chain, that we received from our parents, which they received from their parents, which they received from their parents, and each one telling, so going from the bottom up, let's go now from the top down. The top down now, hands right, you're only going back. I, I know, I, from I, the I, I, up. Okay. I don't, I, I, because you need them to, uh, to understand the bottom up, you have to understand from the top down first. Right. From the top down, it goes that let's call that generation of Moshe and generation X. The what has a name, Dermit, the generation of the desert. They received that Torah now. It's so actually not, uh, not they, it's the next generation already, but uh, that, that was after the Moshe. But already the Dermit received the Torah. And they pass it on to their children. Well, that, most of the children were there at the same time, for that matter. Uh, comes now the next generation, who were not alive at that time. Okay? They now receive from their parents this book. And they say now to their children, look here, you see this book? You see this story about Moshe? You see the story about the Yetzirah Mitzrayim? You see the story about Martin Terror? You see the story about the wanderings in the desert for 40 years? I was right there. I was part of it. You see that story? I, I saw it. I experienced myself. I saw Korah being swallowed up at the earth. I saw what happened there in Shittim. I saw what happened there with Amalek. I saw what happened there and there. I was there myself. And that's not just one person saying that to his children. 
It's 600,000 families telling that to their children. Comes the next generation. You see this book here? My Tati was right there. He saw it. He told me that he experienced that. The next generation, my Tati told me that he heard from his Tati that he was there himself. Next generation, I heard from my Tati that he heard from his Tati that he heard from his Tati that he was right there himself. Now, if I would only have this oral tradition, there's a problem. The problem is called telephone game. Because all traditions have a tendency to become corrupted. If I whisper something at this end of the table, and by the time it gets to the other end of the table, these already things have changed. You didn't pick up something, you misunderstood something, this sound didn't come out clear, he wasn't clear in the way he said it, etc., etc. Uh, if you get 600,000 identical traditions, of course, uh, the, the likelihood is not so. You may get, however, you would get not identical, you would get conflicting. It would definitely have been conflicting traditions. That's where the Torah comes in. The Torah recorded at the time preserves the record as is. The tradition is to preserve the authenticity of the Torah, that the Torah is an authentic document. Not the details in it, but the Torah is an authentic document which has been passed down generation after generation that we have received this. And that comes then to the bottom, and now can can go back from the bottom to the top. Uh, that I heard from my tati that, this, that he heard from his tati, that he heard from his tati and so forth, and the next generation says it one generation less, etc., till you get to the top. So whether you take it from the bottom da- up or from the top down, makes no difference. You have here 600,000 lines of oral tradition verifying the book. A book by itself means nothing. Books have been faked, books have been forged for all times. So, if it, the, and this is exactly the same as all of history. How do you know there was a World War II? You were not there. Your father wasn't even there. Okay? So all your father can tell you is my father was there. He was part of the Ameri- he was either part of the concentration camp. He was there, or he was part of the American army, or he was part of this. He saw this, and he was that. If it's just one person saying that, again, I don't know. If you have several corroborating evidences, corroborating, and then these books are written. Photographs mean nothing. Photographs is a billion dollar industry called Hollywood, where you can make uh, fake videos, fake movies. They show you movies of Alexander the Great, movies about uh, Henry VIII, the movies about Queen Elizabeth, etc., etc. Now, obviously, this is fake, uh, so, but it looks realistic. So, therefore, if uh, we do not have the evidence where does this come from, what is the origin thereof, becomes irrelevant. That people are going to question it at a certain time, again becomes irrelevant. There is probably, no probably no other historical event that has so much evidence of eyewitnesses, of victims, of perpetrators of crimes, of outside witnesses as the Holocaust. Okay? You have not only, oh, suddenly <coughs> six million Jews have disappeared, <clears throat> you have those who survived the camps, you have uh, the people, the liberating armies who came to the camps, you have, for that matter, the documents which they found in the camps, never mind the skeletons and the, 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 the other things, the, the gas chambers, what they found in the camps, etc. You have the records of the Germans. You have the personal admissions of the Germans at their trials. They never denied it. Never denied it. They may have justified it, they may have defended themselves, etc., etc. Nobody ever denied it. Neither the perpetrators of the crimes, nor the victims of the crimes. So this, you, don't, you don't have another event in history, practically, where you have so much universal, because there are so many countries and so many divergent populations that are very involved in that. And yet, barely 30 years after the Holocaust, already in the 70s, there are historians who became what is called Holocaust deniers, who denied there were 6 million victims, who denied that the crimes were there the way it is described, who bring, who, bring, who, who bring evidence even from the Red Cross that the Red Cross visited uh, was it uh, Birkenau uh, or Bergen-Belsen and they came there in 42, 43 and they saw and it's, it's a camp, yes these people are interned called concentration camp and what people, they had a, a nice social life they had the orchestras playing music at the theatre with the inmates, which is true it was a show that was put on before the Red Cross was allowed into camp. All the inmates were forced to do that. And therefore the Red Cross reported everything is fine and dandy. Uh, so therefore to say that, that we have their own records there after, this was for short a time. So for somebody, to, and this is when all these people are still alive. 
There are so many victims still alive. 